Ever since the Parthen sculptures first went on show in the British Museum at the beginning of 1817, there's been this fascination, this quest to discover its ancient colour. But it's kept its secret for nearly 200 years now. The travellers who, in the Enlightenment, went to Athens were able to see more even than we see today of the evidence for painting the architecture. And naturally, they speculated that the sculpture that was framed by the architecture was painted too. But from that time until now, there hasn't been a single strap of evidence to prove that the sculptures from the Parthenon in the British Museum were coloured. Of course, what archaeologists want to do is to make discoveries and in the British Museum so deep are the collections that there are always the possibility for those eureka moments. I was doing regular imaging and I was using a particular kind of light. There was something which was glowing which was beyond the levels I was expecting for that specific case. And so I realized that that was luminescence from Egyptian blue, so it was possible to use those lights to excite this glow-in-the-dark effect. Egyptian blue was widely used across the Mediterranean. So the Greeks used it, the Romans used it, and the Egyptian obviously used it. It's a pigment which has a very special property. It absorbs visible radiation and it re-emits infrared radiation. And the images will show Egyptian blue as glowing white. On this head, there are traces of polychromy, or paint, on the cheek and the sides of the eyes. We cannot see all the pigments which were originally present on this sculpture with the naked eye. But we could use this methodology, which is capable of identifying Egyptian blue, even if it's present only in very minute traces. The same technique which we used on this unidentified head from the Temple of Artemis in Ephesus was used to reveal the presence of Egyptian blue on the Parthenon sculptures. I think there is a collective conspiracy in each generation to forget that ancient sculpture was painted. We forget it because the Renaissance forgot it when they found sculpture in excavations in Rome where paint had faded and contemporary sculptors chose to carve marble without paint. Ours is a culture that still shares the arts and crafts movement aesthetic of truth to materials. We can't bear the thought that one takes marble and polishes it to a sheen and then obscures its white, pure surface with coloured paint. But that is what was done in antiquity. In the pediments, we find colour on the backs of some of the sculptures, which is curious, considering that they would never have been seen once they were placed in position on the bottom shelf of the pediment. But then it's also curious that the sculptures were carved on the backs when they wouldn't be seen. A not impossible explanation is that the sculptures, like the building, were a great votive offering to deity. And by representing the gods and the worshippers, there was an act of religious communion with them. So one could say that out of reverence for the gods, colour was added to the finish where perhaps it wasn't to be seen. There is a reference in Plutarch to Pericles taking visitors while the great works were being undertaken and showing them the carvers in the workshops. And I think we can imagine a privileged viewing of the sculptures before they went up onto the building, never to be seen at such close quarters again until Lord Elgin removed them and turned them back into a privileged viewpoint. Iris, the goddess of the rainbow and of the upper air, is touching down from flight. Her tunic presses itself flat against her belly 
and her breasts and flutters out at the edge and is contained by a belt above the waist. A belt which now, only now, we understand is blue. I confess that after long years of looking and not finding, I'd begun to doubt that the sculptures were painted at all. Then suddenly, there is the belt of iris glowing away, full of Egyptian blue, and everything changes. <laughs>